The book of Romans explains the death of Christ and what it means to us more than any other book in its entirety in the whole New Testament. Romans tells us. That's why Satan has done so much to blind us to it. And so when the Apostle Paul says in Romans 16, 25, Now to him who is able, he spent over 16 chapters telling them why. Why is our Lord God able? Let's look back quickly. I had not planned to do this this morning, but as I was thinking about it, I was just impressed. Start in chapter 1. Keep your finger in 16. But let's look. I don't have a single verse written down. I'm just going to go through my New Testament here and just look at these verses. Romans chapter 1. And notice how it starts. <clears throat> Paul begins in verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus for all of you because your faith is being reported to all the world, God whom I serve with my whole heart. Now, one of that was the key of the great man that he was. In verse uh, uh, 14, I am obligated both to the Greeks and the non-Greeks, to, to the wise and the foolish. That's why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Paul says, I'm a debtor. I'm eager. I'm ready. What a battle call for a man who loves Jesus Christ. Uh, look in verse 26 of chapter 1. Because God gave them over to shameful lust. See, God gave them over. He didn't give up on them. He gave them over to the stupidity and the fantasy of their own hearts. And uh, notice in verse 21, if we can jump back, because that is the great theme. One of the reasons God's wrath and judgment, the main reason it comes on the earth, is here in verse 21 of Romans 1. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God, nor gave thanks to Him. Giving thanks is a very serious business. It's not a casual tipping your hat to God and saying, we appreciate it. It's a reason that God's wrath comes. Turn over to chapter 3. <clears throat> Verse 23, well, verse 21, 321. <clears throat> but now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. We are not here to live by rules. We're here to live by relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. What a tremendous testimony. Look at verse 22. This righteousness, then righteousness is the power to follow Christ, uh, comes through him in Jesus Christ. To all who believe in him, there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The word sin there, hamartias, means you have missed the mark. Every man, every woman who ever lived has. Verse 7 of chapter 4, look at that. One of my favorite quotes from the Old Testament in the book of Romans. Blessed, verse uh, 7, verse, chapter 4 of Romans, 4, 7. Blessed are all the happiness are they, blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. That's you. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Are you in that group? Hallelujah. Can you believe that? that God will never count your sin. Boy, if he wanted to count, anyone ready to stand up and take it? I, I think not. Uh, 512, look at chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, that was Adam, and death through sin, and in this way death came upon all men because of all have sinned. For before the law was given, sin was in the world, but sin is not taken up, etc., etc., through Adam. And then it talks about how the Lord Jesus Christ, look at verse 17, death entered through Adam, but in verse 17, for if by the trespass of one man, Adam, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life, you see? My dear friends, let me share this with you. If we truly grasp the provision of God, all of our problems are secondary. If we truly grasp the provision of the Father for us in Christ, every problem is secondary, if not irrelevant. That does not mean the problems won't hurt us, they won't cause pain and all the rest, but they're irrelevant to God's destiny for us in Christ. Pity the poor Christian who doesn't see his provision 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, verse uh, six, chapter 6, verse 11. In the same way, 611, count yourselves dead to sin but alive unto God in Christ. Do not let sin, 612, reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desire. The soul can make that decision. The soul can't pull it off, but the soul can make that decision. That's our outline, mind, will, and emotion. One of the men at the Bible study Thursday morning said, Pastor, help me hear these words, mind, will, and emotion. Give me a few more. Mind, it's what you think. Will, that's your desire. Emotions, that's your feeling. One of the things wrong, one of the things wrong with modern psychology today, how you feel. Let's get in touch with your feelings. How do you feel about this? Doesn't make a hill of beans how you feel about it. Your feelings are there and all the rest, and the way you feel, fine, but then you must drive those feelings to the answer Christ has for your emotions to be controlled by Him and to reign in life. But it's all about. Seven, oh, the struggle with sin. The last part of this chapter, you remember this one. <clears throat> Paul says at uh, <clears throat> verse 22 of chapter 7, For in my inner being I delight to do God's law. All of us trotted in here today said, Oh, I want to follow God. But, he says, I see another law working in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me? Thanks, God, through Jesus Christ. And then Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there's no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ. You see, the Christian life is not a process of change. The Christian life begins the moment we exchange what we're not for what he is. <laughs> and we do that through faith, see. It's an exchange. You take this, give me that. I said it last week. It's one of my favorite, uh, favorite expressions. For the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, all that I am, I give to you. And then the father looked at his son and said, Son, then all I am, I give to you. The reason we're not what we ought to be is because we haven't given all we are to him so that he can't give all he is to us. And that's exactly what Christ died to achieve. The book of Romans is all about. Verse 18 of chapter 8. I consider our present sufferings are not even worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. Father, forgive me for too often comparing my struggles to your provision, my problem to what you've done for me. Chapter 9 is a discussion of the Jews. Chapter 10, the great passage. Uh, if you believe, you should, well, let's look at it. 10, 9. <clears throat> I'm just going to quote it, but as long as we're there. Here it is. <clears throat> well, let's look at uh, 8. But what does the Scripture say? The Word of God is near you. It is in your mouth. It's in your heart. That is the Word of faith that we proclaim. You can tell the Lord Jesus, Lord, I want to be hungry. I want to be obedient. I want to be pure. Speak to me, and you will have a revelation of Jesus Christ. What he says, if we confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that confession is made, and we are saved. As the scriptures say, I love this verse, verse 11. If you ever been made a fool of, then 99, nine-tenths of the reason is because we have not heard this verse. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Chapter 11, oh, we, uh, let's go to 11 quickly. Here's one of the great verses. I wrote about two or three pages on this this week in verse 32. <clears throat> verse 32. Now, I mustn't be detracted here too much. I might talk about this tonight. God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. My dear friends, every single one of us here today, because of the sin that has gripped mankind, because of our crippled nature, is in a prison. There's not a one of you here today who's not in some kind of limited prison. Your marriage, your business, your health, your future, your age, your youth, your ignorance, what is it? God has consigned all people to the prison house of disobedience. Some of you are dying over the activities of your children. Some of you are living in a marriage you can't get out of. Some of you feel, what are we going to do? There's not a one of us here doesn't have a prison. Now, to make sure, some cells are smaller than others. Some of you have a big cell, and you think you're free, but you're not. And there comes a time when you realize that everything's around you is walls. There's no way to get out except through, I must tell Jesus. Love that verse. 
12, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that's not all in parallel. It's also in progression. You prove the good. Then you know and how to move on to the will of God and know its perfection. Mm, chapter 13, about gifts, how I love you. Chapter 14, oh, how we'd love to stop there in the gifts of the Spirit. Chapter 15, uh, oh, I love, we have to stop here. Verse 3, chapter 15, verse 3. Here's the secret of our Lord's life and your life and mine. For even Christ did not please himself as it is written. The insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Even Christ didn't come to please himself. Why do you wonder? Are you so weak? You're a people pleaser. You're a self pleaser. I'm a self pleaser. Why did the Lord have such a magnificent, wondrous, giving, captivating, mentoring life? Because he wasn't here to please himself. He was here to please the Father. Why is your life so spiritually emaciated, so dull, so boring, so routine? You never do anything significant except make money or raise kids. There's no spiritual power to it because there's too much of pleasing me, not him, see. If you want to be liberated today and have a spirit of thanksgiving you've never known before, make it your aim right here and now. Bang, never again. Father, I live to please only you. And you'll come alive in a new world of dimension. That's the true gospel of the Lord Jesus. <laughs> oh, and then we're to 16. Let's look at 25. You know how it hurt me to go through that this quickly. But then, what do we say now in verse 25 of chapter 16? Paul says, now... To him who is able. I didn't think I'd get that emotional over that. Oh, what a, what a line. <laughs> what truth in view of all he's done. Now let's read it. Now to him who is able to establish, a very interesting word in the Greek, stereozo, which means to fix, to make fast, to set, to make firm, solid, hard, or tough. Now unto him who is able to make you tough. That you can take anything that comes against you, is what he says, to establish you. By my gospel, the gospel that was revealed to him, we read that in Galatians and Ephesians, and the proclamation, not of the church, not of being Baptist, not of being religion, not of the Bible, the proclamation of Jesus Christ. See, that's what motivates us. I hope that will be the one great distinctive of University Baptist Church forever. And Lord, forgive me for the times I've got off that beautiful balance. Man, if they want to go to a church for the Christ, what is it, one of our mottos? The minimum of man's tradition and the maximum of the purpose of Christ. We're having some signs made up on that. God help us live up to it. According to the revelation, so we've talked about that, of the mystery hidden for long ages, but now has been revealed for the church age, the next has gone on now, almost 2,000 years, to every one of us made known through the prophetic writings. And we can go back and look at Isaiah, and look at Psalms, and look at uh, uh, Jeremiah, and look at Daniel, look at all these writings, back to Exodus even, even the Genesis chapter uh, 4, and see the inception of the teaching of the wonder of Jesus Christ. See, Paul says it's all there made known through the writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations, the word is ethnos, ethnic, every ethnic group, not the geographical nations, but all the peoples everywhere with their different cultures and their different languages and their different heritages, might believe, pistuo, literally a response, not just a mental assent, and obey. You know this word obey, does anyone know what that means? Paul, I know you know you're Greek. Upo akuo. I've kind of fussed at Paul for not knowing where he was, but isn't he sweet? He can make a thousand more mistakes for all I'm concerned. I tell you, as sweet as he is. The word obedience is uh, upo and akuo. Upo means under. Akuo means to hear. So literally, if you're going to obey Jesus Christ, what you and I do, you come under the hearing of his voice. That's why some of us don't want a revelation of God. 
Some of us don't want a real prayer life because if I get serious about praying to God, he might tell me something about my life that I don't like and that I don't want to change. Have you ever thought of that? Are you hungry for the Lord Jesus' sake? Upo akuo, upakuo is a word you come under the hearing. Oh, what a place to stop and go through the Bible. Enoch walked with God, and God took him. See? Abraham, lay not thy hand on the lad. Lord, it's me. Moses, approach the bush. Who shall I say? sent me. Isaiah, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. David, I set the Lord's face constantly before me. And on and on it goes of the personal revelations of Jesus Christ. We're not talking about some dead religion or an institutional church here. We're talking about God trying to put a community of people together who hear him and know him, and love him, and obey him, upo akuo. They put up themselves under the hearing of the master. That's why a church service like this, morning and evening, and a Bible study in Sunday school, and your own personal walk with Christ, is so absolutely critical. If you put yourself under the teaching of a man who has put himself under God, you can't do any better on earth than that. But we chase any and everything else, see? And I tell you, it's a pressure. But the burden of Christ, as heavy as it may be, is lighter than any other satanic burden in the world. See? Now then, notice quickly, you can read this. We enter new dimensions of positive living as the greatness of Christ exceeds the supposed greatness of the world around us in our thinking. Now get that, that's heavy. I thought that through a long time. New dimensions of living are ready for us today. Positive living as the greatness of Christ exceeds the supposed greatness of the world. One of the problems with most of us in here today is you really think the world's big, bigger stuff than Jesus. No wonder you're frustrated, confused, and unhappy. The biggest thing going on on this earth is what Jesus says and how I put myself under his hearing, see? We can never compete. Compete. We know about that yesterday, didn't we? We weren't competing very well. I don't know what the story was, but before you get down on the team, just think, hey, man, I've gone into a game looking like that. We couldn't do anything right. You ever had a week like that? All right. So before we point a finger at anyone else, we can never compete triumphantly against worldly evil until we begin to experience the Christ life as more powerful and satisfying than any other life. Now, what life is really uh, dominating you today? Some life is. Is it the life of Christ? I've listed a few here. The fame life, the rich life, the love life, the secure life, the married life, the long life, the pleasure life, the healthy life, the self life, etc., etc. Some of us are dominated by life today. It's either the life of Christ or something else, which is an illusion. Anything other than him is illusion. Until we know the Lord Jesus as bigger and that's why we need revelations of him. Then anything that comes against us, life is a continual defeated experience. Continual defeated experience. Oh, we'll have a high every now and then. Or we'll lock ourselves into some ambiguity and say, oh, we can make it. But God didn't call us to live like that. We read over in Romans, what, seven, six a few minutes ago, we have been called to reign in life. Wasn't six, what was it? Four, I think. Uh, constant revelations of Christ out of every human circumstance, good or bad. Doesn't make any difference what's going on out there. It's what is being revealed to you in here, <laughs> in life. What if every one of us were taken out and locked up in isolated confinement for our belief in Jesus Christ? Could you take it? Yeah, because nothing that would have been stripped away that is really essential. Because the only thing that is essential for me to leave is to bring glory to my Father and to hear his voice. Everything that Jesus had, and that wasn't much, was stripped away. And all that was left to him was to hear the Father's voice and be obedient on the cross. And he lost nothing. See? 
I tell you, in this American society in which we live, there must be a turnaround. Some of us must make up our minds that we are going to die to the glory of God, that we are going to sacrifice ourselves. And I'm not talking about some kind of cranked up, supposed, flesh-oriented spirituality. Give us deepening and strengthening and insights into his mysterious magnificence and our own purpose in living. Remember, one of the things I taught in, in, in August when I was here, when did your life begin? 1932, 1950, 1947, 1968, when you were born. Is that when it began? Did it begin when you became a Christian? I hope every one of you are. Did it begin for me in 1950 when I got on my knees and asked Jesus Christ to come into my life as a 17-year-old student? No, no, no. You were created in Him before the foundation of the world. That must mean, whether I know it or think it or not, I must be rather special to God. Last Sunday night, we talked about his part and our part. And into the world there, I said, praise and receiving are gifts. Do you want praise and receiving? See right below the little outline, which says into the world. I've summarized it. Praise and receiving are gifts. You can only have praise. You can only have receiving when God gives it to you. Purpose and discipline are power. If there's purpose and discipline in your life, that's power. And prayer and giving or work. And you look at that and study that. I hope you will. Hope you'll be back tonight. Now look at this other that I've given you here, these three little circles. And I've never seen this before. And uh, uh, I just thank the Lord for giving it to me. It describes just what I was talking about or trying to talk about. The empty life of the body. Now it's wonderful to have a body and have a mind, will, and emotion and have a words and actions and countenance, excuse me. But do those words, do those actions, does that countenance mean anything? Most people know. So if you, have a, if you really have only the life of the body, you're living in a fantasy-centered world. See the question mark there? You don't know what you believe. So there's a fantasy world. It's you, big you, and your little illusion. And there are some verses. It's a dead end. Notice at the bottom. You never get out. It's a wall. It's a prison you never get out of. Now notice the baby life of the soul. That's self-centered. You may be a Christian here today, and I hope all of you are, but if you're not walking in the power of the Spirit, uh, you're a baby. You're being tossed around. In fact, I threw that in there in Ephesians 4. But at least you can begin. There's hope for you. Hop E. Hop enduringly because the Holy Spirit is in you, and if you begin to hear His revelations, understand how that works, then you will begin this positive and joyous progression. See that at the bottom? That is eternally open. And Christ... And you, Christ becomes the big thing in your life, not you. And notice how I've drawn the bigger circle. See, the bigger Christ gets to us, the smaller the world is to us. And we know how to have it and to conquer it. People say, oh, I have so many things. No, you don't. If you have things, they have you. The only way to have anything that doesn't have you is to have Jesus in control. That's the way that works. Ah, the warrior life. Well, dear friends, what are we to say? Turn to Psalm 16, if you would. Turn over to Psalm 16. <clears throat> I want to close with one verse there about David's personal revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if we have those personal revelations, we're all right. You know, some of us uh, have experienced, you've been a, a passenger on an airplane, <clears throat> and uh, the pilots called back and said, I'm sorry, there's some thunderstorms in front of us. We're going to have to detour. It's going to take about an extra 30 minutes. And I've been on the plane before when the grumbling starts in. Oh, yeah. well, they don't know what a thunderstorm is. There's more power in a thunderstorm. There's an atomic bomb. Did you know that? And one of the first things they teach us in flight school, man, if you start getting into weather, if you ever fly into a thunderstorm, son, you're in big trouble. Don't try to turn around. Just go straight and hold on and pray. That's pretty desperate. Everybody will tear the wings off the thing. So whenever you see a thunderstorm, you always go around. And whenever I was flying and I could see it, I said, uh-oh, I didn't have any problem correcting my course to get around that thing. But if you're sitting back in the back of the airplane, you think, oh, if you've ever been in one, you know what I'm talking about. Now, there's not a one of us here who's not approaching some thunderstorms in your life. It's like the young man who died, 37, Bobby's cousin. A month ago... Yesterday, you don't know what thunderstorms are coming. And only the revelations from Jesus Christ are going to tell you what heading, what path to take, see. 
and I listen. And if the Lord wants me to go this way, I wanted to get married this year. Sorry, that's going to be put off five years. All right, you want him? Huh. About the biggest rat fink you could ever find as a husband. But if you want him, go ahead and take him. You better listen to God's course changes. See? Notice what David said. Read the whole passage. We'll run out of time to read it. But look, verse 11. You have made known to me the path of life. Verse 11, chapter 16. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasure at your right hands. You have made known to me the path of life. My dear friends, may God help us through our revelation of Christ to find his path for every one of you.